Welcome everybody, we'll get started in two minutes. Welcome, as you're joining, you will be placed in silence mode. Uh, a couple of disclaimers, the session will be recorded and made available via on-demand. If you do not wish to participate in a recorded session, uh, this is a good time to disconnect. So as you are placed in a, a silence mode, uh, you can interact with the speakers throughout the day, uh, posting in a Q&A, and they will be addressed at the appropriate moment uh, at, at the end of the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, you can post comments, uh, questions uh, in your preferred social channels, leveraging the hashtag IoT World Day. We'll get started in just a minute. Welcome everybody, welcome to the Industrial uh, Cybersecurity Day, part of the series that, of events that IoT World does to support the October Global Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I'm Lucian Fogoros and together with Greg Orloff will be our, your host for today. On behalf of the distinguished speakers uh, and my team, thank you for joining. Uh, our team will monitor the social channels, so feel free to send your question either uh, leveraging the hashtag IoT World Day or in the Q&A session and we'll address them at the appropriate moment. I'd like to also take this opportunity to, to uh, thank our sponsors, Adolos, RunSafe Security, Temper, Trend Micro, Archer Security, and Building Cyber Security. And at this moment, I'd like to introduce our co-host, Greg Orloff, who will introduce our um, keynote speaker. Thank you, Lucian. The Honorable Lucian Niemeyer is an Assistant Secretary of Defense serving in the Office of Management and Budget at the White House as a Director for National Security and Intelligence Programs. He previously served in the Pentagon providing budgetary and management of the Department of Defense's real property portfolio of over 500,000 buildings valued at $1 trillion. He also specialized in the development of resilient energy and cybersecurity policy development. Prior to his government service, Niemeyer worked in the private sector as the founder of a consulting company after serving on the professional staff of the United States Senate Committee on Armed Services and as an Air Force veteran. Welcome, Lucian. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure to have you here this morning. So maybe if we kick this off with, uh, with the first question, you've concentrated your public service career on ensuring national security facilities and infrastructure can meet the missions of our country depends on for its defense. What trends and challenges are you focusing on now for facilities and infrastructure? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And first of all, I just want to, Greg and, uh, and Lucian, I just want to say congratulations. Happy Cyber Awareness Month. Congratulations put on a fantastic event. And also, I really do appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk to folks from around the country on this. And, and I got to tell you, Lucian, I've never actually shared a stage with somebody with my name. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing to be able to know that, that, that there are two Lucians in the world who are in this industry. So I just wanted to say uh, it's a privilege to, to be able to talk to you both this morning. Hopefully, so yes, uh, hope you, hopefully the we've question, wanted it many times. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's not a lot, not, as you know, there's not a lot of times you get a chance to, to talk to another Lucian. So uh, I appreciate it. So very much, I appreciate the question. So what we're really looking at, I've, I've been 
union federal government in, in and out for the last 20 years and and you, it, it's apparent to see and i think everybody on the on this webinar will also know uh, we are we are rapidly advancing into a digital integrated world um for which we we, we just are we are moving so fast on technology advancement um, that my concern here is that we have a security concern uh, issue that's growing that we're not necessarily advancing as fast. So we really, uh, as we continue to look at uh, the future of 5G, of machine learning, of artificial intelligence, I mean, it really is incumbent upon us to start asking the hard questions that, particularly in the in the, in certain realms, the the OT world, uh, which I want to separate from the cyber world. I, I know, you know, a lot of folks these days talk about cyber threats. Um, and, and from my perspective, there's a lot of emphasis on, on data security, um, but I'm, I'm concerned about um, what can happen from a virtual command uh, more in the physical space. Uh, and that's kind of what I was working on the Department of Defense, continuing to work in federal government. You know, where, where can we um, have, where do we see potential challenges and threats um, in the operational technologies um, as opposed to the, um, uh, in, in the physical world, as opposed to the IT world. So that's kind of what I'm working on right now. And that's really, to me, the biggest challenge I see to both facilities, infrastructure, and, and really any, anything we rely on uh, in our quality of life um, that, that relies on operational technologies. Great insights. Now you mentioned virtual cyber commands into physical actions. Can you give some examples of what, as to what that means? Yeah, sure. We've seen all the headlines today uh, these days of cyber attacks uh, for which um, um, hackers or criminals are 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 seizing data or or stealing your you know your your credit card data or even you know the nuisance of of getting into your laptop and uh, and and seizing up your software um, and and really that's what we as a nation and actually the world that's what we're focusing in on you know what can happen to financial markets as a result of data theft. I believe, uh, and we see, we've seen this trend emerging, um, that eventually cyber criminals are going to move on and potentially threaten you in a more existential way, threaten lives, threaten privacy, threaten security, um, and, and threaten someone's health. And I think um, we need to uh, understand that that can be done. Um, and that's kind of what I mean by the physical world. What, what, a, what can a virtual command do um, within a, a building or within a piece of infrastructure to cause either catastrophic damage or to threaten lives. And unfortunately, um, we do see this trend emerging um, where cyber criminals are tired of, of finding, you know, uh, finding uh, having to go after software because there are protections being put in place. And they're gonna turn to what I believe is the Achilles heel um, for both federal facilities and, and commercial buildings and pretty much any, any place that we rely on to live, to work, uh, to to to, to uh, recreate, um, we 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 see an emerging threat there that we have to address. That's an interesting point. So maybe if we set national security aside for a second, Lucian. Do you believe that our operational technologies are protected? No, I, I really don't. I think you know there are there are, there are a lot of ways uh, that folks don't really are are aware of for which a a cyber criminal or cyber terrorist or a nation state. Um, can get into a facility. You know, I concentrate on national defense facilities for the most part, but it could be any facility. You know, they can turn a, uh, a thermostat into a uh, listening device. <clears throat> um, we have the ability now in an integrated smart world, as you know, most of we, we and we want to continue to promote our smart technologies to, for what it does for us in a positive way as far as efficiencies and, and just a better quality of life. But those same technologies um, can be unfortunately turned against us. It can be as, uh, as sophisticated as um, a, a nation state you know, manipulating dam controls um, to open up a dam and cause catastrophic damage or uh, as, you, as what has been pop, pop, uh, publicized lately, what's happening in our electrical grid um, uh, as far as uh, nation states probing us uh, probing our sensors, probing our op centers, pro probing our infrastructure to see where there might be an opportunity to create a catastrophic power outage. And it could go as small as into a home. You know, a cyber criminal these days um, and hackers have the potential to maybe use the Nest system in your home or um, that you, you connect to your uh, HVAC, you connect to your, your garage doors, you correct all the devices in your home. And unfortunately, there might be an avenue of threatening you that way. Um, and so that's kind of what we're really looking at in the private sector. I think there's a growing threat that goes way beyond the national security threat um, and really can um, uh, fundamentally alter our way of life in, uh, in ways that we're currently seeing with COVID 
you know, where we're having to uh, socially distance and, and work from home. And, and, but a cyber attack on a, on, a, on a physical system where all of a sudden you no longer feel safe in school or you no longer feel safe in your home or you no longer feel safe in your office. It's a whole other level of threat. And so that's kind of why we believe um, that the policies that we need to work on and we are working on go beyond national defense that go on towards society protection. Um, and that's really something that um, we really can do alone and, and really need the, the help of the private sector. Thank you for that insights. And certainly over the last decade or even the last few years, there have been a lot of advancements uh, around the operational technology, detecting the anomalies. Now, from your perspective, what can it be done to address these issues? Yeah, and, and, and I'll be frankly, it's 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 difficult. Um, uh, I'm I'm not a fan of government intervention, and to the degree for which the government has come up with standards uh, such as uh, NIST or otherwise, and and in, in the utility industry has been working with the critical infrastructure protection standards uh, put forth by some uh, governing bodies. Um, it's difficult for those standards to be uh, fully embraced, to some degree understood. Um, and, and not only that, but up, updated to respond to emerging threats. So um, it's, from my perspective, we definitely need um, forums like this, Lucian and Greg, we need a, a public awareness campaign. Um, and bottom line, I don't think government is gonna be able to solve this problem. As you know, you know, when you're, you know, if you're unfortunate enough to, to have your camera taken over and, you know, we've been for years, we put a cover over our camera on our PC or our laptop without knowing, okay, how do we actually protect ourselves from that? Um, but as you know, if you, and you're in your home or even sometimes in your business and you have a cyber attack, you know, you know someone just seizes your software, there's not a lot of folks you can call. Um, there's not a lot of folks who are going to be able to come to your defense um, and say, okay, we can, we can uh, you know, solve this problem for you. That's kind of why companies like Norton and McAfee came up out of nowhere after the first viruses and the first computers. And they created an opportunity for consumers to be able to protect themselves. Unfortunately, I think we're in that realm again, and particularly in the OT threat um, that folks would need to pay attention to. Um, I, I just don't see government really having a big role other than public awareness. Uh, we are working on a national strategy for the protection of control systems, but it's mainly around workforce development and basic good hygiene practices. But um, as you and I know, um, we're probably gonna need to do a lot more to truly get to a point where we in our homes and we're in our offices and our schools uh, feel safer and we know that we are, uh, we do not have a vector of attack uh, um, through uh, building management systems or through operational technologies. And also, you know, uh, Lucian and Greg, that uh, our, our society is nothing but hundreds of millions of control systems. I mean, everything we do do in our lives is, is uh, operates uh, around a virtual command into a physical action. So if you look at the explosion of robotics, you know, what we're going to be relying on for all, and we do need to understand that we, we have to come up with a regime, and I'm not sure government can lead this, it has to be private sector, where we are truly um, engineering protections into those controls to ensure that they cannot be taken over, or at least we have a sensor system whereby if we know there's, there's there's some type of anomaly. We know there's some type of nefarious activity. We can quickly um, seize it, monitor it, or, or um, protect ourselves from it. So, so I, I do believe that it does need to be a private sector lead. Um, I do believe we need to educate the public and then work together with the experts we have across the country to figure out what can we do to um, uh, establish some type of protections that everybody will understand. Hey, Lucian, that's it. It's a powerful statement. Are, are you aware of anyone in the private sector that's tackling this? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you, if you talk to uh, uh, CIOs and CISOs, I think you know, probably the one, the, other than myself, the folks that are staying awake most at night are CISOs, you know, the, the Chief Information Security Officer. I think they, they see in the private sector what a potential threat to mitigation. Um, it's tough to get a CIO to even uh, stop caring about uh, IT systems and start caring about OT. And when a CISO goes to talk to the facility folks, it's like talking two different languages. The facility folks don't even really know, you know, what what their what the threat is. The CISO probably does, but it's tough to get uh, the CISO to to say, hey, we need to invest in these protections. There there are emerging as you know, there's a growth uh, explosive growth of cyber uh, protection firms in this country. 
um, and they are they are really solid in coming in to a company and saying, here's what we think your vulnerability points are, or they give you a rating and where you're vulnerable. And, and, and it's good. I mean, the CEO now has another data point, but it's still really difficult um, for to justify significant or insignificant investments in some cases. Sometimes it doesn't take a lot now, to protect that OT when you don't actually see headlines of an OT threat. Again, I, I, I want to make sure I emphasize here, there's a lot of headlines what's going on with IT attacks. I don't know if you all been tracking the last couple of weeks, but we had a pretty significant attack against the healthcare system in this country, where we had um, a, a cyber terrorist uh, wanting uh, seizing electronic health records in, in exchange for a ransom and potentially harming uh, hospital operations. You know, that's that's going to continue to make the news. What we need to work on is okay, what's the next really big threat? And I do believe eventually that a hospital is going to have to worry about a terrorist coming in and actually seizing equipment through uh, control systems um, and, um, and, and causing potentially real harm to their patients. So the private sector is starting to wake up to this. The insurance companies are starting to wake up to this. Um, and, and yes, there is a lot of discussion about what we need to do. Um, but unfortunately, for what I'm seeing and, and looking down a, across a lot of different sectors of our industry, um, there's not a concerted effort. Folks realize that it's a concern. They realize that um, there needs to be a solution um, but we're not necessarily um, galvanized towards action the way I think we should be. Um, and so there's a lot of bits and pieces. So I think one of the things, reason why I'm talking to you all is uh, first of all, public education of what potentially could happen um, at, through an OT attack, operation technology attack or a control system attack. And then hopefully um, uh, uh, raising awareness and more importantly, a call to action, um, mainly among the private sector uh, stakeholders the ecosystem and there's there's a there's a huge ecosystem out there that wants to address this you've got uh, microsoft and intel and uh and amazon and google looking at this you've got verizon and the telecoms looking at this they're starting to offer home security packages telecom security packages um, you've got uh, in, in certain industries uh, whether it be healthcare, whether it be transportation okay, what do we need to do to actually get after it and answer also, as you know, Greg, we have standards that are out there. NIST standards, uh, International Society of Automation has got standards, 6443. You've got ISO 7000 standards. Unfortunately for me, and I'm not really a smart guy, it's tough for me to see those standards and how they can translate into my life. So I think what, what I'm starting to see in the private sector is folks saying, okay, we've got these sophisticated standards um, for protection of OT. How do we translate them in a way that, um, I hate to say this, Joe Bag of Donuts can understand okay, here's what I need to do in my facility to protect my elevators, to protect my HVAC, to protect my cyber locks, and to protect my escalators so they don't hurt anybody. So I think you're starting to see some movement. It just needs to be galvanized, consolidated, unified, and then ultimately with a productive output. Uh, it's, it's a challenging problem. I, I think it's, uh, I think the, the large part of it it's it's the vast expanse, and I think you hit the nail on the head. It's how do you how do you translate you know the technology, the information, the capability down to and I don't use the term layman. It's just down to anyone within society that can adapt and and understand first of all what's going on, and then how do you be translate that into something that's actionable to ensure that they they're secure, whether it's their home, their yeah. business, their their facility that they manage or they simply work at. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, are, there are a lot of organizations out there. I know I, I'm, I'm, I, I just saw a press release. Uh, Underwriters Lab has partnered with an organization to create a spire system, which is a checklist for facilities. And, that's, and that, those are all great things. Checklists, here's what you need to do. You know, a, a, a cyber a consultants coming in, here's here where your vulnerability points are. And, and, and you end up um, handing the CEO or the CIO a list of things they have to do. The question is, there's not necessarily the financial incentive to go do them, it's more risk mitigation. Um, my goal here is I think there has to be a private sector opportunity here where if you invest in those protections, you, you can get some type of monetary benefit. And I think, um, again, there, there, there are some organizations that are starting to concentrate on that. Um, I can talk a little bit about that here in a minute. That's an interesting point. So, so a financial incentive that would be catalyzed from the private sector and not, not a government initiated one. Did I hear you correctly yeah. on that? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny when government starts imposing uh, 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 regulations or codes, uh, it ends up being a sunk eaten cost. In other words, 
when this country all of a sudden realized we needed fire suppression, fire and fire detection systems in our in our homes and in our in our in our buildings, it, it wasn't like okay, we gave money to everybody who owns a building and said, okay, go do this. Unfortunately, it had to be a cost that was eaten by the building owner or by the device device manager. Um, you know that they and it becomes like uh, what Underwriters Laboratory did for safety standards. It becomes just a part of having to produce. Um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. In a lot of cases, it, it does work, but I'm a, I'm concerned that in the realm of of OT protections, first of all, compliance regimes to me don't work because if the if the threat's constantly evolving, you end up complying with a standard that's now six years old. Um, so it really doesn't do good. That's what what's happening in the utility industry today. They're 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 walking away from these critical infrastructure protection standards because they're not current, uh, because they haven't updated in years. Um, so I think you know coming up with a aspirational framework where you say, okay, I have a threat in to my, I, I believe that I have a a threat in my smart car that I want a level of protection that not everybody else wants um, may want. So I think you do need to have offer to consumers a choice on what they think they're going to need for protections for the OT, as opposed to just assuming that the next smart car you 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 buy or the smart TV has something engineered in it that will protect that will prevent a cyber hack. That's really difficult to do, particularly as the threat evolves pretty pretty aggressively. Um, at least what I've seen in the last few years. Uh, it's it's a definitely a conundrum or an issue that needs to be addressed, and it's multifaceted. But let me let me jump into a couple of questions yeah. that are coming from uh, yeah, there, from Anna, or yeah, real quick, one, 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 one last point, Greg. There, yeah. there are there are some organizations out there that are starting to get after this. Um, um, I'm full. I'm closely following an organization called Building Cybersecurity. They've assembled. Um, they were just formed this year. They're a nonprofit that was just formed this year. And they've assembled an incredible uh, uh, ecosystem of, of end users, anywhere from car companies to telecoms to uh, facility owners, and they and they've got and they've also got control system manufacturers and working with them. They've got insurance companies working with them, um, and they've got uh, and the and the big five ten the super five super techs. So the, there are organizations I think that can bridge that divide. And more importantly, you also need to bridge the divide between the private sector and the public sector. Um, you may know that uh, the federal government does have, uh, through the Department of Homeland Security, the organization called CISA, that is supposed to take the intelligence that we receive um, through the National Security Agency and other national intelligence agencies, and then, and then process it through an organization and get it out to the private sector through what they call ISACs. Um, it, it, it is in place, but it, I'm not so sure as a government-run organization, how effective it can be. So I do believe a, a private sector-led effort that potentially can have a bridge that a public sector can take that intel, get it out to uh, uh, stakeholders that much quicker, and then an offer an opportunity, and here's how you can fix it. I think um, uh, building cybersecurity has a pretty good way, way, way forward. They're working on their first framework. The goal that they're doing is they're taking various standards, uh, ISA standards, um, NIST standards, and ISO, and they're putting it in, in a framework that people can understand um, and then saying, okay, if you want a cyber level, level of protection, a goal level of protection, it could be applied to a device, it could be applied to a car, it can be applied to a building. If you, based on your risk, what do you want to, um, uh, what level do you want to achieve in a certain some type of a certification that is measurable, is objective, and can be applied across uh, all buildings. I think insurance companies are crying for something like this, um, as are uh, as are you know uh, cyber firms that want to have something they can point to, as opposed to saying, "Hey, they, we've got our own secret sauce." They can say, "Yes, we can meet this certification." It's a way to take all these standards and and translate them in a way that end users can understand and that they can market. So, so you could, the next time you walk into a commercial office building or in the case of Amazon, they're looking for millions of square feet in the national capital region. You know, what is, the, they, they, they can protect their IT systems, but they really want to know on a jet to scale what, um, what is protected in the buildings that they want to lease and what those protections are. So I think there are ways to do that. And I, I'm really excited about this organization. And there's a couple of other ones that are working along the same lines to try to address what I believe is a national, actually a global need to be able to objectively uh, set up a framework across technology, processes, and people and what you can do to protect yourself. Yeah, thank you for the insights. Yeah, we look forward to, to support the efforts of the cybersecurity 
building cybersecurity foundation as we are uh, uh, involved in, 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 in marketing the efforts there. Yeah. I think they've got a pretty good group assembled that I think could get after this real quick. The, see, the key for me, Lucian, is speed. How quickly can you get something into the, into the market that folks can, you know, they, they can charge a little extra if they've got a cyber platinum rating. You know, how quickly can you get that into the market where anybody, particularly in the pandemic, you know, what folks back in the buildings when everyone's from home on Zoom calls, as I am. By the way, I do want to apologize, um, but for the most part, working out of our homes, eventually we're going to want to get back in the, in the office buildings. I think what's going to put us back into those buildings is going to be a combination of um, protections and, and security protections, and that's and that's another reason why I believe as we adopt 5G, as we have, you know, as we see, you know, where we're going with um, advanced data transfer, that we have to have a security regime in place as well. Well, it sounds like they're, they're starting to stand up something that may be replicable across different sectors too, as well. I mean, if you're, if you're pulling in that yes, facet that's exactly right, on the insurance piece, it's, it's a lot less of a distance in terms of the jump you have to make to take that to the marine environment or the, or the transportation environments. Most folks are kind of playing in all those fields. So that'll be very interesting to watch that evolve. Yeah, and, and it's a way for us to want to move to take the next step with smart technologies. As you know, there's a lot of folks that just don't want to put in a, put a, a a home monitoring system in their house. They're just concerned about privacy or they're concerned about, you know, what the downside is. And, and I agree. I mean, I, I don't have that stuff in my house, but I do believe that we come up with a, a security framework. It will open up more consumers to want to embrace smart and digital integrated technologies, which I think ultimately is good for our society. Let me ask you a question that we've got several that are rolling in in the, uh, the Q&A portion here. So Pages is asking us, uh, maybe at a higher level, you know, what's the potential impact of industry now moving to wireless sensors and actuators, uh, so away from wired or tether types of technology? Any perspective on that, Lucian? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, first of all, fantastic question, Paige, and, and you're, you're dead on. I mean, I, I think as a society, particularly with uh, 5G, now parts of 5G are going to be you know, backhaul intensive, I get it. Um, but as we move towards wireless, yeah, I think that is the future. I think we're going to want to be able to have sensors at our fingertips um, that may not necessarily uh, uh, allow for a wired connection. Um, and and I and yes, and, and there's definitely a lot of ways where a wireless sensors um, will all offer some protection. The the concern I have here, and it's been borne out, is those wireless sensors can also be can manipulated. Um, I, there was a there was an attack against uh, the power grid in Northwest United States early this year where. They didn't go after the control room. They went after the sensors. They, they went after to see whether we, they can manipulate the sensors so, not, so nobody can see that anything's going wrong. So again, as long as those wireless sensors have some type of nothing more than maybe a, an anomaly detection you know, software or hardware, that if, that if something is different about that sensor, it, they, it sends off an alarm. At least somebody knows that maybe somebody's manipulating or, or, or exploiting that sensor. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of opportunity to, uh, to penetrate for sure. We've got another question from Isaiah. Uh, he's asking, uh, Lucian, can you talk about cost recovery for private sector via state and federal regulatory agencies authorizing cost recovery for implementing security throughout the engineering life cycle, the way that 62443 pushes folks to do? Any, any perspective on that? Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a possibility. Uh, cost recovery to me for a company is going to be some type of tax credit. Yeah, um, that's, that's a possibility. Cost recovery for me, and I want to make sure I say I got it right, cost recovery for me would be either some kind of a tax credit or incentive or um, some type of, of reimbursement um, for those type of investments. Um, I, I think that's potentially down the road. I, I, I don't know how that, what form that would take. Um, I, I'm more interested in letting the market drive it that you can get a financial incentive either through a recruit, re reduced um, insurance premium uh, or you can market it and just say, hey, folks are, will, are willing to pay a little more to be able to uh, have a platinum cyber platinum device or a cyber platinum smart TV or a cyber platinum car that you know has been engineered with uh, either uh, advanced software or advanced hardware, some type of protections in there that you're willing to pay a little bit more for. 
So um, yeah, cost recovery is always an option. Uh, but from my perspective, um, there's, there's better ways to be able to incentivize those investments, uh, mainly through um, um, folks realizing that uh, they can actually make a couple extra dollars off uh, in, in advanced certification. Maybe, maybe there? offer some perspective on, um, and we touched on you know, the world of conformity assessment and standards, and there's a tremendous amount of you know, IP out there and knowledge that's been developed around those through collaboration, you know, whether you're talking IEC, ISO, uh, the U.S. standards body, yep. we've talked well, and some of the other ones. Um, those organizations, that process, the wheels of fortune grind slow, but exceedingly fine. So it's, I think you made the point that it takes quite a bit of time. By the time you get something out at the end of the tunnel, it may be obsolete. What, any perspective on what we can do to either accelerate that, augment it, change it into a more collaboratory environment, partly with regulation as well? Yeah. No, I think, you know, first of all, I mean, I've been spending a lot of time over the last two years because I've, I've been trying to protect uh, national security facilities. And look, the standards out there are fantastic. NIST does a great job. ISA does a fantastic job for their for their customers. And, and in talking to the folks at ISA and ISO, I mean, the standards are out there. The question is, how do you get folks want to invest in them? You know, it's how do you get folks actually make that decision? How's it, that's that C-suite decision? That yes, I want to conform to this standard. Um, and it, and it, it'd be tough to, to, to put it on a device. This device is ISO 7000 compliant or ISA or ISA 6243 compliant. I mean, not a lot of consumers understand that. You know what I mean? So, so, and they wouldn't really, I mean, not, I mean, I don't even, do you check the underwriters lab label on every device you buy or any, any appliance? I mean, it's just, it's just standard practice. So I think, yes, those would be great to get those standards out there. There's a lot of good organizations, but a lot of hard work. I think in talking to the, those organizations, there's frustration, all the hard work they put into it and some great industry input on that. And best practices just end up sitting in a, in a graph somewhere or in a book. Uh, but not necessarily being acted upon. And that's really what I'm trying to figure out. How do we get action on this, some, of, some of these standards that are out there? Yeah, I think we even had a comment in here to, to that effect. It was, um, I think it was a, I think it was another Isaiah put in there that just referenced the, you know, the crisis, the Triton, the Hatman, and Ukrainian incident, um, where insiders cause accidents in manufacturing, oil and gas sector, water. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you have to take these catastrophic um, incidents and um, what's the action yeah. resulting from it? Kind of chirp, chirp, chirp. <laughs> Other than the organization that's directly involved. Well, I mean, uh, utilities do care. I mean, if you yeah. if you look at who's spent the most on on cyber protections for both OT and IT, it's utilities. I mean, they don't want to lose power. <laughs> they don't want to lose customers. So they're so they're investing because they have a real profit margin to protect. Um, and I and I think that's the way to go. Now the question is, how do you create that that profit opportunity for other sectors that will want to invest similarly in cyber protections? Yes, absolutely. Lucian, I know you're coming up at, at the time that you need to go to the airport. So we appreciate your time making it uh, and and supporting us on this event. Uh, safe travels, uh, um, and for, appreciate the insights that you provided today. For those of you that uh, may have other questions, feel free to take them on the social channels, leveraging the hashtag IOT World Day. We will uh, follow up with those to get the appropriate answers. I uh, want to thank uh, Honorable Lucian Meyer for joining us, Greg for facilitating, and those of you that participated, stick around for the rest of the day. Uh, there is a, a lot of different sections that you uh, you want to join. So, for instance, there is a um, over the next hour and a half, if you'd like to join, there is an ICS uh, supply chain cybersecurity. I've heard it referred to as the the best uh, crash course that uh, crash course that uh, that's available on cyber security for supply chain. That's available on demand. So feel free to to take a look at Patrick Miller and uh, Eric Byers there and, and, and their team. Um, also at right around 11 o'clock, we're gonna have a best practices for industrial cybersecurity. So uh, join us there um, 
And we also want to thank uh, our sponsors, Adolus, RunSafe Security, Tempered, uh, Trend Micro, Archer Security, and Building Cybersecurity for their support for this event. So see you all throughout the day. Mr. Nehemiah, safe travels. Any, any closing comments as, as we part ways? Yeah, so Lucian and Greg, I am I am so thrilled to be able to talk to you all. I, I so wish I could spend the rest of the day on the call. Unfortunately, I got to fly out to San Diego. I will be spending this weekend going back over some of the recorded uh, discussions, but um, my hat's off to the both of you for putting together an amazing event. I know the pandemic's a tough time to bring folks together. Um, and I'm just really thrilled that to be able to align uh, with what efforts you're going and to continue this public education. We do need to educate the public and then we also need to come up with some solutions. So I'm hoping today uh, is productive for the both of you and for everybody on the call. And then we, we can ultimately figure out, okay, how do we solve this, start solving this problem? So thank you, Lucian. Thank you, Greg, for all the work you've put in preparing this day and look forward to be able to uh, stay in touch with you guys and move it into the future. Absolutely. It was a pleasure to host you here. And, and as, as we mentioned, there's a lot of opportunities to interact with each other. So we brought everybody through LinkedIn so you can interact with the people. Just take a look at the 5,000 plus people that, that responded. And then you can also take a look who was on this session. You can request to be able to, uh, to get to know each other. It is focused on the same area. So um, you can see here the agenda. As you click on each of the session, you can kind of take a look at who's who's in there. And uh, uh, yeah, so we'll see you around in about an hour. Greg, any other comments or that or? No, I think it's a fantastic perspective. And, and thank you, Lucian, for joining us. It was a uh, look forward to the next time we get to uh, engage your your expertise, as I always say. Safe travels to you as well. Yeah, I'm actually, it's more, it, it's not as much an expertise, it's more desperation. I'm, I'm, I'm not able to sleep <laughs> at night knowing everything I know about what, what we're faced with as a nation. So I really, what I'm asking for is if you guys can do your job really well, I can sleep better. So that's kind of what, how I'm looking at this. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, see you. All right, take care. One, uh, one, about an hour and 15 minutes.